Hello, everyone, and welcome to Heritage Events Live. Uh, today, we have a webinar on COVID-19 and the U.S. economy. My name is Ellie Krasny, and I'm Heritage's Manager of Public Programs. Before we get started, I want to share a few housekeeping items that will maximize your webinar experience. This session is being recorded, and we will have it posted on Heritage's website within 48 hours. So please check out our website to see this session and learn more about what we have for webinars. All of you attendees are in listen-only mode, but we still encourage questions. You can submit your questions in the Q&A box on the lower right-hand side of the screen. If you'd like, feel free to uh, share your name and your organization. We love to know who's tuning into our webinar. And with that, um, I would like to hand it over to our expert, Romina, and her colleagues. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. Thank you for joining us on this webinar on COVID-19 and the U.S. economy. We find ourselves truly in exceptional and extraordinary times. And I'm excited that we can spend some time this morning talking about what has happened to the U.S. economy with the latest numbers showing 22 million Americans unemployed, with many more that have not been able to file for unemployment benefits yet, including the self-employed that are not currently being counted. Even though we're looking at already a 15% unemployment rate as our economy has been frozen in place due to mitigation measures to slow the spread of this coronavirus that originated in Wuhan, China. What we wanna to do today is just give you an overview for how this has affected our economy and the relief actions that Congress has taken and continues to take in order to address uh, the economic fallout from the coronavirus crisis. And one example that we'll be speaking quite a bit about is the CARES Act. And that is a truly a massive legislative package. If you compare it to the American Recovery and Reinvestment Act, that was the stimulus package, passed under President Obama during the Great Recession, the CARES Act is more than twice the size of that stimulus package, which at the time was the largest relief package. And now the CARES Act is the largest relief package in history. Compared to our federal budget, the CARES Act at $1.8 trillion is half of all federal revenues collected last year. And it's coming close to um, about not quite half of what we spend in any given year. In total, the measures that Congress has taken from the emergency package at the beginning of this crisis that spent $8 billion to the Families First Response Act that added roughly $200 billion, the CARES Act at $1.8 trillion, and also the National Disaster Declaration uh, through which the President offered authorized funds for states, localities, and territories to fight COVID-19. We've roughly spent $2.5 trillion. And uh, tomorrow, and perhaps even today, the House will vote on another half a trillion dollar package, bringing the deficit impact just from the measures to fight COVID-19 to roughly $3 trillion. We were expected to have a trillion dollar deficit this year, even before the coronavirus pandemic that deficit has already been quadrupled and Congress continues talk, to talk about further relief measures. To talk about what's happened so far and what we should be focused on now, especially as American society reawakens from the COVID-19 lockdown, how we can have a strong economic recovery, are my colleagues, Rachel Gressler, who is a research fellow, fellow in the Grover M. Herman Center for the Federal Budget. She comes to us with experience from Capitol Hill and is an expert in labor policy, pensions, and budgets. And after Rachel, we'll hear from Adam Michelle, who's an economist in our program Herman Center, focused on tax and fiscal policy. With that, uh, Rachel, um, talk to us about some of the relief packages that Congress has been passing. What was the intent and um, how are they working out? Thank you, Romina. So I wanted to start with kind of where we were going into this whole health pandemic. Um, what was the goal when we were starting to address the situation? What did the CARES Act do? And then what problems might it have introduced? 
So before COVID-19 hit the US, we had an exceptionally strong labor market. Um, unemployment rate of 3.5% was at a half century low. We were seeing strong wage gains, especially among lower income workers. Um, and GDP growth was strong. And we also were seeing more workers coming into the labor market. People who had previously been discouraged or were marginalized, they were joining the ranks of the labor force. Um, and then COVID-19 happened and a lot of people were forced into unemployment, places had to close. And so this is not like another recession where there's something fundamentally wrong with the economy that is causing there to not be jobs available. This is something that was self-imposed to try and stop the spread of the health pandemic. So what we have here is a goal to try and bridge the gap. We start in one place that's very strong and now we're in this forced slowdown and we wanna get back to where we were. Now, the best way to do that is to provide targeted and temporary relief. Um, it's not a normal recession where you just wanna stimulate the economy. And so I have a slide up here that's showing the effect of that. If you just send checks to everybody and that was part of the CARES package, you're raising everybody's incomes by a small amount, but for people who lost their jobs completely, that's not enough. So you see at the far right side there, those people who have no income and now have that small boost in the green, it's still not anywhere near what they need. And then the people on the far left side who either haven't lost their jobs and still have full employment, maybe working remotely, or those who now have more employment, companies like Amazon, grocery stores, certain health sectors, they have this added boost that doesn't benefit anybody because it's kind of a windfall there. And so the alternative, and I'll add, um, um, to the second slide here is to provide that targeted relief and so you try to meet people where they are so that you can bridge the gap um, so let's see if that second slide is available that shows targeted relief to everybody and what this goal is is to keep people employed that's really the key thing that we want to do here and that is how you bridge the gap is that even if people aren't working we want them to have that connection to their previous employer so that once things are ready to start going again you still have the job you're able to come back to work as it's safe to do so and that income will not have been lost if that aid has been more targeted and just meets the people who are experiencing the lost revenues the lost income so let's talk about what's in the CARES Act and whether or not it accomplished these goals, because in some ways it did, and in other ways it actually has created new problems and also spent some money that was not necessary and probably won't provide a lot of benefit. Um, one of the first things that the CARES Act did was to just try and fix a previous provision in the Families First Coronavirus Response Act, which was a mandate on smaller employers, smaller being anyone with fewer than 500 employees, so actually a, a significant portion of the labor force. Um, there was a mandate that they would provide two weeks worth of paid sick leave and up to 10 weeks worth of paid family leave. And that could be for things such as an, a parent staying home with a child because their school has been closed. So it was pretty widespread. And this was really problematic for smaller businesses because they simply didn't have the money to keep paying workers if they're not coming into work and producing any value. And while the act did provide a credit that could be refunded in the future, it wasn't soon enough. And so companies, small companies on average have only 27 days worth of cash flow. So they weren't able to pay these benefits without having the actual cash on hand. So the CARES Act tried to fix that by providing an advance credit so that employers could file for this credit and get the money before their employees actually were out. So that was one thing that tried to help it, but we are still hearing from small employers that this is problematic um, and it's causing them to want to lay people off when they otherwise might have kept them employed. Um, the second thing that probably everybody here knows about is the checks to households. So if you are an individual, earning less than $75,000 a year, you get a $1,200 check. Couples earning less than $150,000, a $2,400 check, and then $500 per child who is 16 or younger. Um, and those do phase out for individuals between $75,000 and $100,000, and for married couples between $150,000 and $198,000. So probably a lot of people have already seen those checks deposited into their bank accounts. And while helpful in some regard for people who have lost income, as I said before, for some people it's just an added boost, for some people it's not enough. And so that wasn't the only thing that could be done because it certainly wouldn't have been enough for certain people. So another component that has probably been the most successful so far is called the Paycheck Protection Program. 
And this is a loan program to small businesses, but it functions more like a grant. So any company with fewer than 500 workers can apply for this. What they can receive is up to two and a half months worth of their typical payroll costs. So if normally you're paying out $100,000 per month, you could get a loan for $250,000. And then as long as you use that loan to cover your payrolls, things like mortgage, rent, utilities, that portion will be forgiven. So if the money gets out quickly enough, this is a way to try to keep people connected to their employers for those, those companies not to have to make layoffs. Um, there were some problems though, you know, there was huge demand for this program. Originally there was $349 billion that was granted towards it, but within 13 days, the program ran out of money. Um, it has already made 1.6 million loans, but there are a lot of people sitting there waiting. Um, as Romina mentioned, probably either today or tomorrow, we will see an expansion in that program for another $310 billion in funding. Um, we hope that that money will help more small businesses not have to close their doors for good and help keep a lot of people employed. Um, but we would like to see going forward for it to be a more targeted forgiveness. As it's worded right now, pretty much any company can apply to receive these loans, even if they still have 100% of the revenues they normally do coming in, because it's just based on some level of uncertainty going forward. And so we would like to see Congress change the forgiveness portion so that you will only get the, the revenues you've actually lost forgiven. And that would be a way to spread that money further to benefit more um, individuals and companies. And then the most problematic component of the CARES Act was this unemployment insurance benefit. So there are millions of people who are losing their jobs. We've already had 22 million over four weeks and it's gonna keep rising. There are individuals who haven't yet been able to even file because the systems are so backed up. Um, so we need to do something for these people who lose their jobs through no fault of their own. And in this situation, because it is temporary and governments are forcing shutdowns, it makes sense to provide a little more than unemployment insurance normally would. You know, typically, if you were making $1,000 a week um, and you filed for unemployment insurance, you would only receive about half of what you were previously making or $500. So in this instance, Congress passed something that would provide instead of just 80%, 90%, they decided to give a $600 bonus benefit to everybody, regardless of what they were making before. So if you were making $100 per week before, or if you're making $1,000 per week before, you get the same $600 benefit. The problem with that, and I'm gonna ask Ellie to pull up a slide here that shows um, the graphic of the distribution of what people earn in the US versus what this benefit would provide, is that this actually creates a situation where a majority of US workers would make more from unemployment than from remaining employed. So the median worker in the US could make an extra $2,300 over four months of unemployment. Um, and the difference is even bigger for people who are making lower wages. Somebody making between 10 and $15 per hour would get an extra 5,000 to 7,000 in benefits. Um, I'm gonna turn my video off here for just a minute. Hopefully this will come through a little clearer. Um, so this is really problematic because some employers are going to then lay off their workers when they otherwise would have kept them employed um, because they know that this benefit is there and that it's going to provide individuals with more than they were previously working. And then we also have a lot of instances we're hearing about people are quitting and they're not willing to come back to work even if a company has decided to reopen because the bonus benefits are making it so that they make more on unemployment than they would being employed. We've heard you know, Nissan in Alabama laid off 4,000 workers because they wanted the benefits instead of um, the pay from being employed and Arkansas Mill did a similar thing. There's a coffee shop that wanted to stay open particularly because it was located by a hospital and they had a lot of people wanting to get to come and pick up coffee, but their workers weren't willing to keep working because unemployment was more beneficial for them. And so we have actually um, done some estimates at the Heritage Foundation with my colleague, Drew Gontrowski, and we've modeled the impact of this bonus $600 benefit. And we find that it's going to increase total employment by about 13.9 million beyond what it would have been, and also result in an additional 955 billion to 1.5 trillion in lost output. So this is something that's really gonna weigh down on the economy and prevent a stronger recovery than we otherwise would have had. So talking about recovery, how do we get Americans back to work? This is not just gonna be a one day we open everything up situation, but it's kind of gradual reopenings and taking into account what safety precautions are necessary. 
So to get people back to their productive measures, I think it's going to have to be somewhat of a case by case, um, you know, looking at the statistics and where is it safe to reopen. I look at my hometown, hometown of New York, um, Jamestown, New York, and it's about nine hours from New York City. It's very rural. They've had very few cases of COVID-19. And so what applies in New York City doesn't necessarily make sense for them. And they are probably able to reopen things earlier than other parts of the state. And so I think it's going to take into account certain statistical measures and health measures as opposed to just statewide or even nationwide decisions about when things will reopen. Um, but we are already seeing some things reopening. What's going to be most um, important going forward is that we are looking out for those at-risk populations. And so individuals who don't want to be going back into work, who have a health condition, who would suffer more from contracting the virus, that they would have other options available to them. And that could include more flexibility to work remotely. Um, another big thing that I think coming out of this is going to be freelancing in the gig economy and just having these options available for workers. 35% um, of Americans freelanced last year. And that's not everybody is doing this completely on their own for 100% of their income. You know, some people are doing it entirely for their, on their own, but some people are just using it as a secondary job for extra income. And that's what's going to be important coming out of this now is that maybe people are going to be reemployed, but they're only going to have 50% of the work that they previously had. And so if they're able to tap into freelancing, whether that is through the gig economy, contract based, temp agency, whatever it is, we want that to be available for workers. And then we see places like California that have enacted laws that basically make that type of work illegal. And they say everybody must work for an employer and they must commit to the traditional type of employment situation that is really just gonna take away options. Um, a survey by the freelancers union found that among the people who don't freelance, three out of four of them say that they would freelance if there was a recession. And that's because I think they see it as this kind of on-demand source of income. And so we wanna really keep that open going forward. Um, so I'm gonna, tr I'm gonna take a break here and turn it over to Adam. Thank you so much, Rachel. Uh, I'm back. This is Romina Bacha. I'm the director of the Grover M. Herman Center for the Federal Budget at the Heritage Foundation. Rachel talked us through several of the relief measures, uh, including the fact that there are some measures like the unemployment expansion that directly contradict other measures like the Paycheck Protection Program that seeks to keep workers attached to their uh, employers. And then the unemployment expansion does the exact opposite, encouraging workers and employers uh, to separate uh, because the unemployed can collect more by becoming unemployed than by staying employed. That's deeply pro problematic. Um, Adam, there were other provisions in the CARES Act, including uh, tax provisions. Last week was supposed to be tax day. That was bumped, I believe, to July. Can you talk us through what some of those other provisions uh, are that folks should know about? Which ones are good? Are there any bad ones? Um, turning it over to you. Thanks, Romina. Uh, I think it's interesting that we, we start with the uh, whether they're called recovery rebates or the checks that, that folks are starting to receive. The, this month, April 15th, uh, was supposed to be tax day, but instead it was, a, it was sort of a reverse tax day. It was around that date that uh, many Americans started getting those, uh, those rebate checks uh, deposited into their accounts. Uh, and instead of, the, of, of us sending our tax returns into the IRS, the IRS was, was instead uh, de depositing money into many people's checking accounts. Uh, so the, it wasn't officially included in the CARES Act, but Treasury and the IRS have extended the, the first quarter estimated tax payments and that uh, April 15th tax filing deadline to July 15th. Uh, so for individuals, what that means is that you simply just get more time to, to file your tax return. You're not required to, to wait until uh, July 15th to, to file. Um, if you are expecting to receive a return, receive money back, uh, people can still can, can still file their, their returns. But it, it gives people a, a little bit more time to to figure out um, to figure out uh, where the paperwork is and, and how to complete their their tax returns. It also gives the IRS um, more flexibility. They're also social distancing and trying to work remote. And so this provides a little more flexibility uh, to to spread out the number of people that are 
that are uh, that are sending things in in through their systems. Uh, for businesses, uh, there's a they also get a delay uh, to uh, to July 15th for filing their their tax returns, but they also uh, get a delay in sending in their estimated tax payments. Businesses uh, that pay a business uh, business income tax, corporate income tax, have to send in their 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 taxes on a quarterly basis, four times a year. And so the delaying when they have to send that first quarter payment in uh, gives businesses a little additional um, uh, cash on hand to help cover, cover costs when they're struggling to keep the lights in or find money for rent. This just simply allows them to wait another couple of months before they have to find the money to, to pay taxes on any, uh, on any profits that they earned in, in that fourth quarter. Uh, a similar provision that was included in the CARES Act defers payroll taxes uh, for an even longer period of time. Uh, payroll taxes that businesses collect and send to the government, both the individual portion uh, that, that we pay and the p p pay, uh, piece that businesses um, are, are required to collect, are delayed through the end of 2021 or then due in a couple of installments uh, beyond then. And this similarly gives businesses additional money on hand to uh, to to really help bridge bridge this gap, changing the timing of when those payments are made, but not the, the total amount that ultimately will be due. The other big uh, provision that, that I think is most important in the, in the CARES Act is a similar shift in timing, and there's a lot of misinformation going on around it. Uh, th this is a change to net operating losses, and it, it sounds complicated, but it, 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 at, at its sort of core, it really isn't. Uh, if we think of a business as uh, maybe having two components, one that uh, is, is, is delivering things online right now and making, uh, making a, a profit, and another that uh, is part of a, the economy that is shut down right now, that is person-to-person -person, um, communication or interaction, they're going to have a profit in one part of the business and a loss in the other. And we want them to be able to offset that profit with some of the losses so that if they, if they make a profit of $10 and a loss of $10, they shouldn't owe any, any income tax in, 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 in this year. Similarly, we want businesses to be able to uh, take losses and profits and average them across, uh, across uh, tax years, uh, not just within tax years. And so the expansion of net operating losses simply allows businesses to take uh, take losses that they have on the books that the tax code otherwise wouldn't have allowed them to use this year uh, and use them this year or even use them in, uh, in for previous years refiling past tax returns and receiving refunds now rather than having to wait for 2021 2022 uh, when the money is maybe less useful than it would be today when folks are are, are struggling to make ends meet there's a bunch of other uh, really important provisions in the CARES Act. There's changes to how folks can access their, uh, their retirement accounts, um, removing some penalties in that space. Uh, there's uh, a, some uh, favorable treatment of, uh, of businesses helping folks pay off their student loan payments. There's some technical corrections to the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act. Happy to answer questions about any of those uh, at the end. But the, the, big, the big important pieces are the delays in, in all of those taxes uh, being due so that folks can make ends meet and an expansion of businesses being able to realize losses um, now rather than having to wait multiple years. Thank you so much, Adam. Uh, I want to ask you a follow-up question, and that is, uh, Rachel talked to us a little bit about the small business loans, the so-called Paycheck Protection Program. But there's also um, loans and grants for big businesses in the CARES Act, and some of those come with strings attached. I believe one of them is a limit on stock buybacks. Can you talk to us a little bit about the monies for big businesses? What are those strings, and are they are they helpful or are they harmful? Yeah, that's a. I think there's been a lot of focus put on the Paycheck Protection Program the, for small businesses. Uh, that where the, the government provides loans to these businesses that are ultimately uh, forgivable, at least up to a point, um, turning them into grants. For large businesses, uh, there is there is also a loan program, but the loans aren't forgivable. They're traditional loans that, that ultimately have to be paid back. Uh, there's several different strings attached to these loans. I think the, the one that is uh, most, maybe not most unfortunate, but is an outgrowth of uh, a uh, sort of 
miss another misunderstanding from the 2017 tax reform debate is a restriction on stock buybacks, uh, perpetuating the the notion that stock buybacks are somehow a, a, a evil phenomenon or something that, that hurts the economy, which is simply not the case. Uh, following the, the tax cuts in 2017, some companies purchased their some of their stock back from investors. Um, this stock buyback can be thought of as an optional dividend payment, giving investors the option to uh, get some of their investment back um, from the company. At its core, this is really a business saying uh, humbly that they don't have anything better to do with that investment um, at that time. And instead, they're giving that money back to it to their investors so that the, the investors can decide where else in the economy that money can be best put to use. This ultimately is a, is a benefit to, to workers uh, across the United States. It allows new capital to be deployed in, uh, in the most uh, innovative and new sectors of the economy, building new factories, uh, new R&D. All of these things come from investment being freed up, and that's part of what stock buybacks do. Uh, in addition to a ban on stock buybacks, uh, these treasury loans to large businesses ban uh, ban dividend payments, they ban increases in executive pay, they ban changes, uh, significant changes in payroll. And while some of these restrictions may make sense during the term of the loan itself, the uh, many of the, of the restrictions extend for one and sometimes two years after the loan um, has been fully paid back by the business. And this is where I think the problem really exists it needlessly keeps businesses stuck in a 2019 world when they need to be innovating and changing for a post-coronavirus 2021, 2022 world where markets may look very different. Businesses may need to expand or contract or, uh, or move money uh, out, out from, from one business to another. And all of these restrictions just make it harder for some of our largest businesses to, to, to really meet those challenges and retool for the demands of a new economy. And so the, the, the fix is simple. Congress can simply uh, roll some of these requirements back so that they end uh, when, the, when the loans uh, end rather than extending beyond there. Thank you very much, Adam. I, um, I want to take this opportunity and shift gears a bit, moving towards talking about as American society reawakens from the COVID-19 lockdown, how do we uh, get people back to work? How do we get uh, business uh, back off the ground? And how do we return to that strong economy that we had back in January and February before uh, this pandemic hit not just the United States, but really the entire world economy? So um, I'm also seeing that we have questions already come in. That's very exciting. Uh, please stick around. We'll get to your questions in roughly the next uh, 15 minutes or so. And I want to um, come back to Rachel and ask you specifically, uh, you already started talking about this a little bit, but how do we get Americans back to work? Uh, many state governors have announced uh, end dates for their stay-at-home orders. Some um, businesses that weren't initially considered essential will be allowed to reopen. How do we get people back to work, especially in light of very generous unemployment benefits. Uh, what are your recommendations also for how we can ensure that there is flexibility and um, options available for people uh, to return to work? Rachel? Yep, thanks, Romina. Um, I think one of the keys going forward is going to be this flexibility, um, flexibility across states, across the country to make decisions about when it's wise to reopen and also flexibility for the workers themselves to know when it is safe and they're comfortable going back to work. And I do think that something that will hopefully be a silver lining coming out of this might be some increased flexibility so that workers can have kind of more of the schedules that they like, the ability to work remotely, not 100% of the time, but sometimes. Um, and we're also seeing an increased technology that could help coming out of this um, COVID-induced downturn, help people to be more prepared and to have some more options out there for workers. And so I think it does have to be um, gradual and based on what works in each location, but hopefully there will be avenues out there. Um, as I mentioned, keeping areas open for gig work and temp work or contract work, people who have lost their jobs and perhaps that company is closed down, they need a place to go. 
Um, there are also some issues like licensing restrictions. And so a lot of workers now are required to get a license in order to just practice something. And certainly in some areas, this makes sense. We want our doctors to be licensed. But when it comes to things like being a florist or cutting people's hair, you don't necessarily need to have a license to do that. We know that people can do that. And oftentimes they can do it out of their own homes. And yet there are restrictions in place that prevent people from entering the market without a license and also prevent those people who have licenses from crossing one state to another and being able to work in multiple states. And so we might have a situation where people don't have work where they are now and they would like to move somewhere else where work is available, yet they would have to go through the entire licensing process again. And so I think that freeing some of those up would help. And we've already seen as part of this crisis, some work done on that. We've seen many states are temporarily waiving medical licensing requirements um, so that they can have nurses and doctors cross borders. There's been Texas, um, allows the alcohol delivery trucks now to also deliver groceries because they had a shortage in demand of the trucks that were licensed and regulated allowed to deliver groceries. Um, certainly it shouldn't make too much difference what you're delivering. So hopefully those some of these will keep going um, forward and we can see a little bit more flexibility. There are also restrictions on people practicing a business out of their home. Um, there have been cases where people have been told they have to shut down whether they were teaching a couple yoga classes, uploading videos to YouTube, um, or even practicing accounting from their homes, and yet they've been shut down because they didn't have the proper licensing um, to say that they were allowed to do that, allowed to earn a livelihood effectively. Um, there are a lot of fixes that need to be made in the CARES Act. Um, so one of them is capping the unemployment insurance benefits at no more than 100% of wages. Um, as I said before, there's a problem in there right now that so many people aren't going to be willing to come back to work and we've already seen this happening. Um, so we wanna make a fix. It makes sense to pay more than 50% of wages, but certainly not to pay 100% or 200% or 300% what some people are getting. Um, there are also some problems with the unemployment benefits just in general. I've heard people that if they are furloughed and their company is still keeping them employed in some capacity, just sending like one paycheck a week for a couple hours so that they're able to receive health insurance, they've been denied for the unemployment insurance benefits because they're still technically employed. And so there are some fixes that will need to be made to that system. As I said before, we estimate that just this $600 bonus benefit could add an additional 14 million people losing their jobs and lost output between 955 billion and 1.49 trillion. So that's a huge hit to the economy and something that we absolutely wanna be encouraging people to go back to work if they're able to do so and in a safe way. Um, another thing is to paycheck protection program, fix that so that the businesses that really need the money are the ones that are getting it. As I said, tons of businesses, millions and millions have applied for these loans and some of those businesses have gotten loans and they might not necessarily need the money to actually keep their payrolls going. They might still have 100% of their revenues or maybe it's 90% of their revenues coming in. And so the amount that is forgiven should be tied to the actual revenues that they have lost. Um, and then one more thing I want to caution about going forward is that there's been a push recently to bail out state and local governments to provide them with funds to cover things that have nothing to do with COVID-19 or they're only tangentially related to COVID-19. And this is things like Illinois writing a letter to Congress and asking for $40 billion to cover things like its unfunded pension system. These are problems that are decades in the making and have nothing to do with the COVID-19 crisis. And we need to be limiting the amount of federal money that goes out to be only that is actually targeted and temporary and is addressing the actual COVID-19 crisis and is doing it in a way that will help our economy get back so that it can run on its own and not need this additional assistance from the government. Um, one story I heard, or case actually just in my county here, is that the states currently have this money and that they have to use it for COVID-19 reasons, and they don't necessarily want to use it for that. They want to be able to pay it for things like lost revenues, pensions, other things. Um, but even within the amount that they have, they're not able to find enough reasons for COVID-19. So my county has increased the pay of its public sector workers by $10 per hour or $3 per hour, depending on whether they're front office or back office. And this is while millions of other people are losing their jobs and their paychecks entirely. So we definitely don't want to be financing 
these states using money for things that are not related to COVID-19. Thank you so much, Rachel. And so we had a little visit, visitor pop by there. Um, we're all um, doing our best to, to work from home and it's been uh, quite a, a change, I think, for a lot of people having uh, their families home all day and um, hopefully some flexibility uh, will allow people to continue to combine work and their home life as well as uh, we need to make it easier for folks to be able to get childcare as well, which is another a recommendation that can help with the economic recovery. Uh, Adam, on that point, how, how should we think about economic recovery? We, um, Rachel briefly talked about states asking for money from the federal government to shore up uh, their revenue uh, shortfalls. Um, we've heard Senator McConnell uh, yesterday, the Senate voted on this new half a trillion dollar expansion of the Paycheck Protection Program and additional money for testing in hospitals. There was a talk about monies for states as well. Now they're saying they wanna do this in the phase four package. They're talking about that being some sort of a stimulus package. Do we need a stimulus to kickstart the economy or what do we need to get uh, Americans back to work? That's a great question. And I think it's going to become increasingly front and center as, as you note, as we sort of move uh, move closer to to the the next big package that that Congress passes, and I think it's helpful to step back and start with what we know about uh, American businesses, the American economy. We know that that Americans and our companies are are entrepreneurial. We know that uh, the American people are hardworking, uh, that they're ready to go back to work uh, when the when these stay at home orders are lifted, and so. What ultimately Congress and local lawmakers uh, can do to be most effective in, in this new world we found ourselves in is remove existing barriers to economic activity that would allow the private sector to lead a quick American uh, economic revival. Romy, uh, excuse me, Rachel touched on some really important labor reforms to help folks get back to work. Um, providing flexibility, removing licenses. All of these are, are, in, are really incredibly helpful ways government can get out of the way and let people uh, choose the work that, that most suits them in the locations that, 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 it most, that they want to live in. But there's uh, any number of other reforms that, can, that, that Congress and state legislatures can carry out. We know that entrepreneurs are gonna be critical to our, our economic uh, comeback, uh, whether or not they're finding new products that, are gonna, that people are gonna want in the, in the, new, um, in the new economy uh, or retooling existing businesses to, to, to fit the new normal. Uh, right now, there are uh, impediments to entrepreneurs and small businesses simply accessing the capital, the investment that they need in order to scale up, in order to do the research and development that's, that's necessary to bring new products to market. So Congress can do simple things like, uh, like simplify the, the rules around, um, around public offerings, allowing businesses to gain new and small businesses to gain new investors, uh, allow entrepreneurs to use third parties to find, uh, to find investment uh, out in the economy, which they're currently prohibited to, uh, from doing. There's also reforms that, that Congress can, can make to help supply chains work more effectively. Uh, one thing that I've worked on a lot is uh, creating certainty for small businesses that sell things online so that they can't, they're not subject to 10,000 different sales tax jurisdictions around the country um, simply when they put their products for, sa uh, for sale online. Congress can, 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 can make, make it so that states can only tax businesses that are actually located in their, uh, in, in the, in, within the borders of their state. Uh, there's also reforms that can be done to permitting and environmental review processes that allow uh, new projects to, to get up and running more quickly. These are all uh, things that, that Congress and state legislatures can do. What, what they can't do uh, effectively is, is some sort of large uh, stimulus package where the government spend, spends money in order to, to restart the economy. Uh, the most uh, popular example of this is, is some sort of infrastructure spending uh, bill where, uh, where the government uh, funds a new infrastructure projects across the country. Um, and the idea is that this will create new, new construction jobs. Uh, unfortunately, we have a, a, a 
a example in 2008 of the government trying this, just this, and it was wholly ineffective. Uh, when the government injects new money into, into certain industries, instead of creating a large number of new jobs, it largely shifts jobs from the private sector to the government, uh, direct, to the government priorities that, that the government is funding. Uh, instead of, uh, in, instead of uh, creating new jobs, we're simply shifting jobs from one place uh, to, to another. And so this ultimately makes a recovery more difficult rather than helping a recovery. It, uh, re it refocuses the economy around the priorities of the federal government here in Washington rather than the priorities that, that consumers and, uh, and, and people on the ground uh, desire. And it's ultimately that, that consumer demand, that uh, person-led um, uh, economic system that will lead to a robust economic recovery uh, that will be led by the private sector, by businesses, by workers. Uh, and so the governments at all levels uh, would, would do best to, to let that process play out uh, and, and get out of the way as much as possible, allowing people to work, allowing people to invest, and allowing businesses to retool for the, the new economy. Thank you, Adam. Uh, I want to move on uh, to take questions now. And um, I saw a couple of questions from Samuel and Andy about the $600 unemployment benefit. Uh, Rachel, those are for you. One of the questions is, um, what can we do to fix this now? Could we impose an immediate cap on it? And what's the expiration date on that $600 benefit if uh, we, we, we don't fix it before then? Yes. Thank you. Um, I think, unfortunately, there's not going to be much chance of Congress going back and changing this benefit. Um, it would be helpful if they do. And maybe if they hear enough stories of businesses not being able to reopen, they'll make some adjustments to it. But even so, there are some ways that governors could be trying to enforce the integrity of their programs, reminding um, individuals and businesses that what the program is meant for. And it's not supposed to be a choice that you don't want to be a work, want to work, but the fact that you actually have no work. Um, and these benefits will be available until July 31st, so essentially four months worth of them, and you can claim it retroactively, and a lot of people are doing that because they haven't gotten into the system, and so that's obviously problematic as we already seen. A lot of governors are announcing their plans to start gradually reopening things, and we're at the end of April now, and so we've got three whole months ahead of us potentially where there could be people who are not willing to come back to work, and yet the work is there for them. You know, a message to employers would be to remind them, you know, if you can't come back to work, I'm going to find people who are willing to, and this job may not be here for you when you do want to come back to work. Ooh, that's a uh, that's a harsh message, but it might be a, a necessary one. Um, Adam, the next question is for you. I'm going to ask you two questions. We have a question from Joseph. Um, is there an estimate once we are able to reopen the economy, how long it will um, take to get back to the strong economy we had in January? And uh, once you address that, um, Sven is asking, with all of uh, these new deficits uh, being basically financed by printing money, the Federal Reserve, um, buying up uh, bonds and buying up a lot of debt. Um, what do you expect will happen to interest rates and um, could, could you see a future where there might be negative interest rates um, in the United States like we've been seeing in Europe? Uh, both, uh, both great questions and I think both uh, have a whole lot of uncertainty around them. Uh, one, the sort of once we've opened up and how do we and what, what's the timeline for getting the economy back to where it was it, I think it really depends on uh, on two things. One, how long we stay closed and how much of the economy remains closed. The longer we, we the p crucial pieces of our economy stay closed uh, and more businesses uh, can't make ends meet uh, and, and businesses unfortunately start to fail, that could ripple through the economy in ways that, um, that are really detrimental. That uh, when a business goes under, you don't just lose those jobs, but you lose all of the organizational know-how and capital uh, that's organized in, in very specific ways to meet specific purposes. And so the, the longer and the more businesses uh, that aren't able to restart once we once we open things back up, I think the more challenging it will be to, to restart quickly. 
Um, so that's why the PPP program and a lot of the things that Rachel talked about are, 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 are important to keep folks above water while we address the health crisis. Uh, and, then, and then the government response is also incredibly imp important um, once we start to open up. If we uh, mandate new minimum wages and new environmental requirements on our airlines and, um, and a lot of the things, the other things that have been proposed that are new restrictions on economic activity, uh, we, we could see a recovery like we did after 2008, um, where we, we experimented with many of those policies, new regulatory regimes um, on the banks, for example. These, all, these are all things that slow the economic recovery. However, if, we, if policymakers get out of the way, remove existing restrictions, help people get back to work, uh, or help people help themselves get back to work, uh, these are, I think we can see a, a recovery that looks much different than the one that we, we saw previously. Um, on the second point on debt, just very quickly, the, the debt we're racking up is, is tremendous. Um, again, there's very, very little is known about how this amount of debt is going to impact markets, um, whether they be interest rates or, or, or economic activity. We know there's real costs there. Um, often uh, it's the uncertainty of, of investors investing less, moving their money into safer assets rather than um, taking risky bets that we need to, uh, for an innovative, strong economy. Um, but I think the real, fe the real fear, especially here in the United States, is that we'll, uh, we'll implement some sort of a large new tax um, system, whether it be a value added tax or a carbon tax, um, to, to sort of pay down these debts. And that will just dig us deeper into the economic uh, uh, hole if that's the path we go down, rather than um, consolidating um, things on the spending side, finding savings, uh, and, and prudently addressing our fiscal crisis. Um, rather than, than simply trying to tax our way out of it, which we know doesn't work and, um, and drives economies into the ground. Thank you, Adam. Um, I am hopeful that uh, the uh, playbook that we'll see uh, coming after this will be di very different than what we saw during the Obama administration, uh, there was a great article in the Wall Street Journal how President Trump has really changed the playbook. It's true that usually coming out of a crisis, we see more regulation, government growing in both size and scope. We've certainly seen it in, in size with all of these relief packages. Uh, most of those policies, thankfully, are temporary and uh, will be allowed to expire. I think that will be really important. On the regulatory front, I think I'm, a, I'm more optimistic that President Trump and his administration will focus, continue to focus on deregulation, waiving rules that would stand in the way of a recovery. And uh, that's been really one of the big drivers of uh, economic growth before we had this pandemic. And I think that's also the exact medicine that we'll need to get out of this. I have a question now for uh, Rachel from uh, Daniel DiMartino. Uh, check out his work. He's a good friend of mine. He survived socialism in Venezuela and uh, lived to tell the tale, sharing with all of us in the United States what not to do um, so we don't end up like uh, the fa this failed country of uh, Venezuela. But his question has to do with entitlement programs, uh, Medicare and Social Security, which were already on a path to insolvency. Um, how will the additional health care spending that's happening now to respond to coronavirus affect uh, spending for Medicare and uh, the health of its trust fund. Also with the decline in payroll taxes, how will that impact Social Security's trust funds? And will Congress have to do something to avoid insolvency coming even sooner? Um, what should some of those reforms look like and what's the prospect of making entitlement reforms uh, following this crisis? Uh, Rachel, for you. Thank you. Yes, so there's been a lot more medical spending going on. I think a lot of that will come more from the general revenues, but one of the bigger impacts is going to be all of the lost income that individuals are having. And so a lot of the revenue that goes into these trust funds, it's a function of how much money you make, your payroll taxes that go into the system. So both for Medicare and for Social Security, there's gonna be a decline in revenues. And depending on what the recovery looks like coming out of this, we could have more than a couple months. It could be a matter of years in which the the systems will be taking in less revenue than they previously thought they would. Now, we already know that these programs are bankrupt. Social Security will be insolvent by 2034, if not sooner. And the 
lack of revenues coming in now will only shorten that date. There's also an issue with disability insurance. Um, while it's supposed to only be for people who are physically unable to work, um, it often functions as more of an early retirement program or a long-term unemployment insurance program. And so when we look at the last recession, um, economists have tried to pair out how much of the increase in new disability insurance applicants was because of the recession versus actual disabilities. They found that the recession caused an extra 400,000 people to enter the system at a cost of another $100 billion. So you can see how heavily that's weighing on it and how that makes it all the more imminent that Congress needs to act to reform the system. And yet at the same time, it's harder to do it when you are experiencing a downturn and people have fewer um, revenues coming in. We have a comprehensive set of proposals at the Heritage Foundation for both a disability insurance program, which is more complicated, and we actually have 16 specific steps we recommend there, but also for social security. And one of the biggest things that we would like to see is moving towards a more universal benefit. So bring benefits down for people at the top who don't necessarily need that much um, and bring benefits up at the bottom because these were supposed to be anti-poverty programs. And also just makes sense to increase um, or to index the life expectancy, the age at which you can first collect benefits to that life expectancy, considering the fact that when social security first started, the average individual didn't even live to receive social security. Um, there's also some other common sense changes, just like changing the inflation measure to a more accurate one. And we have actually modeled this and found that you could make both the disability and the social security systems solvent, and you could actually reduce people's taxes. And that's one of the biggest goals going forward is to return some more of that money that people are currently having to pay into the payroll systems to let them have that money to save on their own. Because the reality is particularly lower income people don't have enough money to save on their own because so much of it is going into the system. Thank you, Rachel. Uh, I have another question here from Steve Dewey. Um, he's asking about the cost of uh, the total packages. I'll take a quick stab at this one. I've been writing about the cost of uh, the CARES relief packages and what that will do to our deficits. So Steve, for you, yes, there was a phase one package uh, that spent roughly $8 billion. That was a so-called emergency spending package, primarily providing a relief to um, hospitals and uh, FEMA to deal with disaster response in this crisis. After that, we had the phase two families first coronavirus response act. Um, that was the bill that provided the paid leave mandate and also uh, tax credits for businesses to be able to uh, pay their employees if they had to stay home because they were sick with COVID-19, taking care of somebody who was sick with COVID-19 or to take care of children and other dependents who uh, were no longer able to go to schools, daycare, and other, uh, and other places. And uh, uh, CBO recently scored that at $192 billion. So between phase, four, uh, phase one and phase two, we're looking already at uh, $200 billion. Then came the uh, CARES Act, uh, the single largest relief package in US history. And that is estimated to increase deficits by 1.8 trillion. So phase one, two, and three, you have a total of 2 trillion in deficit spending. The uh, CARES Act is actually much larger. There's about an additional 500 billion uh, in loan guarantees, but CBO, the Congressional Budget Office, did not score those as increasing deficits because they expect those loans to be repaid it remains to be seen if businesses take out loans and then go bankrupt, um, the taxpayer may be taking losses. I think a lot of that will depend on um, how quickly we're able to reopen American society and the economy so that, that businesses can start earning revenues again and begin to pay down uh, these loans. And then just yesterday, the Senate agreed to another roughly $500 billion package. Uh, that puts us at 2.5 trillion in total deficit spending. And there's already talk of a phase four uh, package, which we hope will focus on providing regulatory relief, fixing problems with the CARES Act, like the unemployment provision that make it harder for people to return to work and for businesses to rehire uh, their, their workers. And, um, and that it will not include a misguided stimulus because initially we heard um, 
talks of a stimulus of roughly a trillion to perhaps $2 trillion. And I think that would really uh, be misguided and make us much uh, worse off. I'm just looking if we have any other questions. I don't see any other questions at this time. So I want to take an opportunity and ask, um, let's start with Adam and ask Adam um, if you have any parting thoughts for our participants today, what is uh, one thing that you would hope they will take away from today's conversation? Well, thank you, Romina. Um, uh, I think the parting thought is that lawmakers should focus on removing existing barriers to investment, to production, and to work. Uh, this will allow the private sector to lead uh, what will hopefully be a swift and strong American recovery. Thank you. Uh, Rachel, how about you? What are some uh, parting thoughts that you'd like to leave our participants with today? Yes, I'd just like to say that really the best economic response to this temporary but major slowdown is to try and bridge the gap through targeted and temporary supports. And the most important of those is to keep people employed and to help keep businesses alive. Um, the only policies that Congress should be considering are ones that are targeted to those most in need, targeted to the direct impacts of COVID-19, and ones that don't last longer than needed. Thank you very much, uh, both of you, Rachel Gressler and Adam Michelle of the Heritage Foundation for uh, joining us this morning for this webinar to share with um, everyone participating how COVID-19 has impacted our economy, what Congress has done to provide relief, which of those policies are good that are helping and which of those are actually hurting and they're harmful and how we can fix them and what will be necessary for a strong economic recovery and I also want to um, give a shout out to the Heritage Foundation National uh, Coronavirus Recovery Commission. Um, that is a commission that Heritage has stood up. We recently issued our first uh, set of recommendations. It provides recommendations for the administration, for Congress, for governors, for states and localities, for what's important to allow Americans to return to work and to allow American society to reawaken from this coronavirus lockdown? And what are some of the important policies that lawmakers should consider when it comes to testing, tracing, isolating to protect those most vulnerable and allowing uh, the rest of America uh, to go back to work using a targeted local approach to allow different communities that have been hit differently by the coronavirus. Cities like New York City have been hit especially hard for them Reopening might take longer. More rural areas that haven't seen any or not very many cases can reopen sooner. So for anyone interested, uh, please check out uh, the Heritage Foundation's National Coronavirus Recovery Commission. And you can also find all of our work on COVID-19 at heritage.org slash coronavirus. And with that, thank you so much. Um, if you came in late today, this webinar will be available via email so you can watch it later uh, within roughly uh, 48 hours and you should also be able to find it at heritage.org events. So again, thank you for your time this morning and you can find Adam and I on Twitter at Adam and uh, Michelle and at Romina Bacha and uh, hope to see you again soon.